Small Town Tales podcast is produced by 22 Creations Multimedia, LLC. This is the show where you'll hear paranormal tales, haunting legends, and spiritual insights about the metaphysical world. Explore the paranormal through small town lore with experts and guests from all walks of life. Welcome to Small Town Tales Podcast with C.L. Thomas. There's one word for the country right now as we head into February, and that is Valentine's Day. Okay, maybe that's not true. For those in the Deep South, Mardi Gras beats out Valentine's by far. But for the rest of the country, everything is painted red with cute little cupids and hearts. But... Valentine's Day reminds us of the Notre's organized crime network based on the Valentine's Day massacre that shocked the world in 1929. Gang warfare ruled the streets of Chicago during the late 1920s as chief gangster, mob boss himself, Al Capone, sought to consolidate control by eliminating his rivals in the illegal trades of bootlegging. Valentine's Day is the anniversary of when a rash of gang violence reached its peak in a garage on the Chicago's north side when seven men associated with the Irish gangster George Bugs Moran, one of Capone's longtime enemies, were shot to death by several men dressed as policemen. The Valentine's Day massacre to this day remains an unsolved crime. The city of Vegas has always been ground zero, a meeting point, if you will, for organized crime families across the country. In a 1963 book, the Green Felt Jungle, Ovid Damaris and Ed Reed were the first to expose Las Vegas' dark underbelly, discussing the role of mobsters, prostitution, and political racketeering in control of the city. They highlighted noters mob bosses such as Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, Gus Green- Greenbaum, and Benny Binion. For those not familiar with Vegas, Benjamin Siegel, or Bugsy, he was the guy who built the Flamingo, and Benny Binion we all know this. He built Binion's. Um, the lesser known casino with Binion is um, South Point here on the south side of Las Vegas. This book, written by Mayor Reporters, is an important contribution to early history of Las Vegas. The book documents a time prior to the transition from gangster control of the city to its cleanup and finally the purchase of the casinos by legitimate companies with the fall of organized crime. What a lot of people don't realize is even though we know the mafia as as operating in the 30s during Prohibition, it actually was in effect. They they had a lot of control all the way up until the 90s. Movies and books have fascinated the world for years about the lives of major mob family players. My guest tonight will share his personal experiences of growing up in a mobster's son as a mobster's son and how he teamed with the FBI to bring down Chicago's murderous crime family. Frank Calabrese, author of Operation Family Secrets, will share his story right here on Small Town Tales Podcast. Stay tuned after this. What if demonic activity isn't as rare as you've been led to believe? Author and creator of Small Town Tales Podcast, C.L. Thomas, shares her terrifying demonic experiences that forever changed her life and the way she views the paranormal. From disembodied voices to poltergeist activity, shadow figures, physical scratches, and illnesses to literally losing her entire livelihood, C.L. Thomas takes the reader on a personal and chilling journey that she lived through herself. Learn why the Hollywood portrayal of demons is not accurate, and why a demonic infestation is more insidious than what you see in films. Dancing with Demons will be available in both print and digital order on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. Signed copies will be available through clthomas.org. Dancing with Demons by C.L. Thomas. Small Town Tales podcast continues. Tonight we will dive into the story and perspectives of someone who has walked the shadowy paths of organized crimes. Las Vegas seems to be ground zero for all mob connections and ties. Recently, I've met someone at the Mob Museum who has an incredible story to share about growing up in the mob. Frank Calabrese is the son of a mob boss, and he's here to share his story in his book, Operation Family Secrets, How a Mobster's Son and the FBI Brought Down Chicago's Murderous Crime Family. 
Brian Calabrese Jr. is an organized crime insider and expert, and his book made him a New York Times best-selling author. From growing up in the mob to initiating a federal investigation into his father's dealings while in prison, Calabrese Jr. knows more than his share about redemption, courage, responsibility, morality, loyal, loyalty, criminality, and commerce. I'm very honored to have him on Small Town Tales podcast. Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you for having me on. Frank, there's so many things to ask you. And we've met in person at the Mob Museum, and I'm so excited to have you on the show. Um, I really want to get you talking and to share as much of your story as possible. Um, so let's start with you growing up in the mob. And what was your family connection exactly to this mob? Well, I'm half Irish, half Italian. I was born and raised in Chicago. On my Italian side, my dad and my uncle Nick were both high-ranking maid members of the Chicago mob. And on my Irish side, my mother's side, my grandfather, um, he was an Irish mob. He was a bodyguard and driver for uh, Miles O'Donnell, the leader of the O'Donnell gang, who was involved in a lot of historical shootouts with Al Capone. My uncle on my Irish side, Ed Hanley, started out in a local in Cicero with the Hotel Restaurant Employees Union and the boss at the time, Tony Accardo, seen his potential. My uncle wound up being the international president the hotel and restaurant employees union for over 33 years so that was my family background into this picturing the movie perdition if you've if you've seen that movie i, I did see it i mean it was a while since i've seen it but uh yeah a little bit you know, that's that's one of the things um in chicago you weren't supposed to bring your kids in this life you were supposed to make a better life for them over the years the, Ch the chicago outfit started going more underground, getting away from violence as much as possible. And, um, you know, so as kids in the neighborhood, even though a lot of our fathers were in this life, you know, we didn't know much about it, nor did we care. It wasn't our life. It wasn't going to be our life. At what point, I know there's a, there's a scene from that movie that I wanted to reference, and that's the part where the young boy finds out exactly what his dad did for a living and it, it changed him um, completely in the movie and he had a hard time dealing with that. Was that you? Um, um, not really because this was all very gradual. So in grammar school, we know our dads were different. We knew that, you know I mean? One time when I had the show and tell at school, I says, Hey dad, everybody's got to say what their dads do for work. I really don't know what you do. What do I tell him? He said, oh, I'm an, uh, I'm an engineer. And I says, train engineer? He said, no, no, no. Operating engineer, local 150. Here's my uh, union card. I said, oh, okay. So, I mean, that was good enough for me. Um, in eighth grade, there was some articles in the paper. So, you know, early 70s, there were some articles in the paper. I was born in 1916. Early 70s, some articles in the paper, Godfather comes out. So we had a little bit of an idea what our fathers did, but we really didn't know that much. Like I said, again, I was involved in sports. Uh, I was going to a Catholic high school for football and basketball. You know, I wanted to go away to college when I graduated. I was infatuated years later with, with law. So it wasn't a big deal. In high school, my dad slowly would show us, slowly he would groom you a little bit about what he was doing. And he put it in a way that, you know, I want to teach you about the street, teach street smarts, go to school and learn book smarts. So, you know, these little tests or these little tasks for me at first were just like be a good son and do it for your dad. So I really didn't. It was not this big cultural change right away because a lot of this was so... Uh, prominent in our neighborhood also even though it was underground what kind of little tests did he have you do well you know uh, uh one test he did was uh, i used to love cars and i'd wash his car my grandfather's car my uncle's car my mother's car and uh, one day you know i was going in there to wash the car well you know i'm going back and i lift up the mat and God, there's thousands and thousands of dollars all spread out under the mat, all messy in 50s and 100s. 
And the first thing I did was I locked the doors. I ran upstairs. Dad, Dad, what? I go, you know, there's a whole bunch of money in your car under the mat. He goes, yeah. Did you touch any of it? I go, no. Okay, so, you know, I, those were the kind of tests. Now, he started to see a, a lot of him in me because when he would give me stuff to do, I was good at it. Okay, I did have a lot of him in me. And, he seen that. and the more that he's seen that, the more he slowly got me involved. And I, I really used the word slowly. So it wasn't presented to me at first. He didn't say, hey, when you graduate high school, here's a mob handbook, an application. What about, you know, career in this life? No, it was more of do this for your dad, be a good son, I need your help kind of stuff. Did you have any siblings growing up? Yes, I have two brothers. I have a brother, Kurt, that's 16, young, 16 months younger than me, and a brother, Nikki, that's 11 years younger than me. So from there, when did you start getting more involved with the mob in your father? Well, through my years, some of the tasks he gave me, um, first of all, we had the biggest loan sharking crew on the street. Um, I shouldn't say biggest. We, had, uh, one, we put out the most money in the whole city, you know, well over a million dollars regularly. And, um, you know, that's kind of... Uh, Loan sharking is, uh, they call it the juice loans in Chicago and the vigorous in New York. Um, and then we had a little sports book going, sports betting. And then one of the major things we had going in the, in the 70s when I started was adult bookstores, peep shows. There were cash cows back then. I would go with my uncle to collect on a regular basis all this money that was coming in. And I did a lot of book work. So a lot of people out there, they assume, when they think of the mob, they think of the 1930s and bootlegging. I think a lot of times they miss that mob activity went all the way up into the 90s. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, there's also going to be organized crime activity to this day. It just doesn't involve the Italian-American mafia anymore. The players have changed, you know. Russian mob, the Asian mob, cartels, Middle Eastern, their gangs. So there's always a criminal organization. The game changes and the way to make money changes. You know, and it was just more than what you've seen in the movies. It's getting into uh, legitimate companies, uh, shell companies, uh, money laundering, and anywhere where there's a large amount of money to be made and you can manipulate your way into it, there's going to be a criminal organization. That's what, what I learned over the years was manipulation. Manipulation uh, um, is a very strong tool. You know, it has to do with perception and deception. You know, I want you to perceive me as a good guy so I can deceive you. I want to find out what you have that I can take. And when I find it out, I'm going to work on your vices and weaknesses to get it from you. So what was the relationship with your dad um, first growing up and then once you got older, as you got more involved with the organized crime? My relationship with my dad as, as, as a young man, I should say young man, as a teenager, as a kid, um, you know, we had a great childhood. My dad never brought the street in the house. Okay, and I idolized my dad and I used to be with him all the time. I wanted to be like him, like every son, you know, idolizes their dad. You know, he was home f every day, pretty much at five o'clock. That's when dinner was supposed to be put on the table. We had to make our beds. We had chores. Never spoiled us. He, 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 he taught us accountability for our actions. He taught us to respect your elders, respect women, don't swear in front of them. You know, also don't be a bully. You know, there was a story one time when I was young. You know, when I started, I wasn't like I had a toothpick in my mouth and I was standing in the corner with all these big muscles and people feared me. You know, as a young kid, I looked at Obie Taylor, Ron, Ron Howard from uh, Mayberry RFD. And I was so shy, I didn't even want to go to school, let alone go to birthday parties. It got so bad. My parents, you know, I was getting in trouble because I didn't want to go to school. And then they said, look, if you don't go to the birthday party, you're going to stand in the corner the whole time. 
I'd rather choose the corner. One day, one of the neighborhood bullies started beating me up. I'm on the ground crying. I finally had enough. I didn't even know I had it in me. I wound up biting me between the legs. I got on top of my beat the crap out of them. I ran home crying, hiding in the basement, chicken. The doorbell rings. It's the bully and his mother. The mother's screaming at my dad and my grandfather about hospital bills. He pays him the money. He comes back. Frankie, son, son, relax. Hold on. Any son of mine that stands up to a bully, I'll probably pay it. A hospital bill. If you are the uh, the bully, I'll break your legs. You know. At the same time, my grandma, my grandfather's like, "Freaky, why you got to always cry? You beat up the neighborhood bully, crying." You know. So again, yeah, you know, he taught me all of this, and, and, and to this day, you know, I, I I don't like violence. I was involved in it one time, but that doesn't mean I had to like it. I like to have a good time with everybody. I, I like people unless they may reason not to. So how did that relationship develop moving forward as you got into the the crime? Um, I remember when you were telling your story at the mom museum, um, you said at some point you were kind of fearful of your dad. Yeah, I I always feared my dad um, uh, for a lot of reasons. But as I started getting older, my dad was got faster with his hands and he couldn't control his temper. And it seemed like the street, to not just to me, but all the family members, that it seemed like the street was changing my dad. And we started noticing that more paranoid, more controlling, more manipulative, and more violent with family members. And that's when we first started to see these changes that was starting to concern me a little. You know, and, and, and because he's a family member, you always have the codependent. Oh, he's just going through a bad time. He's going to be okay. You know, so you're always hoping that this ain't going to last long. And it wouldn't last long a lot of times. You know, one day he'd lay a hand on you, and then then for weeks he'd be this great dad. Then all of a sudden one day you do something that he didn't want you to do, and you catch a crack in the face or in the back of the head, and, and, and you just see this animal right away. So it would play with our minds, and it was starting to concern me. Now, in my early 20s, you know, I was introduced to another part of the mob that I had that I didn't know my dad was involved with, and that was murder. Murder for hire, murder upon orders. My dad and my uncle were one of two hit teams that the bosses, would, bosses in Chicago would use. They wanted somebody dead and dead done, done right. One night in my early 20s, my dad comes home from his night at work. His adrenaline's going. He goes, we got to talk. We went in the bathroom. We turned on the the water. He said to me, he goes, remember I told you there's rules in the neighborhood? Yeah. Remember I told you there's consequences if you break them? Yeah. We had to kill two guys tonight in Cicero. And he, dropped, he describes in detail how they blew them apart with shotguns. Okay, and that and that was the first time he introduced me to this. And the reason he was introducing me is he wanted to see if I was ready. Well, I was ready because this is my thought process at the time. This is my dad. He's got my best intentions at hand. If this is what he's telling me, he's telling me for a reason. Wow, man, the street's crazy, but there's rules. You got to follow them. You know, he's never going to lead me down the right path. And then graduated. When I graduated, it was arson, extortion, violence, day-to-day book words, and also planning and assisting in murders. So, um, you know, it, it, it took me, you know, and when I did, I bought into it. I bought into it, you know, uh, 100%, but I didn't buy into the mob or all this criminal activity. I bought into my family, bought into the loyalty. I bought into what my dad was telling me this all, was all about, that it's about a better neighborhood, a safer neighborhood, a better life for your family, protect your family. That's what I bought into. Was it that to some degree, though? With the mob activity, did it make improvements in the neighborhood a little bit? Yeah, it did. It did, but yeah. you got to remember this is this is in my twenties. There's a lot of changes going on in the eighties in the mobs because some guys lived that way a hundred percent, and some guys used and abused that authority. Okay, so yeah, so it was, but that was the general idea of what it was supposed to be, and at one time it worked very well in the neighborhood. 
Um, but while these, all these changes are going on and I'm getting deeper with my dad and my uncle in all of this, the governments get stronger in the 80s, the, the, the mob's getting more paranoid, my dad is changing more and more, he had multiple personalities, and I'm starting to not like what I see from my dad, and I also, um, he's, it's not what he told me it was going to be. All this stuff about the mob and all we were doing, it wasn't what he said it was going to be. And you got to understand, I've worked all my life. That's what say, you know, that's what helped me redeem myself when I got out. Most guys that did what I did, when they, when they go legit, it's very hard because when things get hard, you go back to what you know. Okay, so because I always work out, and I'm looking at my friends whose fathers are in this life that are not involved, they're making good money, they got businesses, I'm making, I have a real job, I'm making money, I got side businesses on the side, and I'm starting to lose interest in this. I meet a girl, I get married, I have kids over time, and, uh, you know, a lot, a lot is changing, and, and a lot of what I'm seeing has helped me make these decisions. I don't know if I want to do this no more, that my dad's not the man that, he, that, he, that I knew when we were younger. You know, in this life on the street, you got to have two personalities. You have your street personality and your, and your home personality. You don't treat your family like you treat people on the street. You don't have to have your guard up with your family like you do on the street. And the hardest thing, even in, in law enforcement, undercover and stuff, when you're doing this for a long time, most of the time these personalities start to blend. Okay, and when they do and when you bring that street in the home and you introduce your family to it, it starts to erode the family structure. And that's what was happening. There. How close is the story Casino real? Well, uh, one thing about Hollywood, okay, when you want to watch, when you want to watch what really happened, the closest you're going to get is when you do a documentary. Okay. Hollywood a lot. They'll take a lot of parts of it. They'll take maybe three or four characters and, and combine them into one because they only have 60 to 90 minutes to tell this long story. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a guy that was on the street and other guys I know that have been on the street or in the life, they can attest to this is when you're watching one of those movies, you see it, you know it's real. You say, oh, no way, that would never happen. That guy could never do that on the street. So it, it, it's not a percentage of me. There's parts of the movie that are Hollywood, and there's parts of the movie that are very true to life. So it's a nice mm -hmm. mixture. And the reason why is they don't want you as an average person to know what's real and not real. They want you to get excited in the movie. <laughs> I guess the reason I ask is because um, there, you told a story about how your dad was, the whole story about Vegas, where there was a guy hired by the mob to take care of the and run uh, several of the casinos here in town. And um, I think it was like the Stardust and a couple others. And there was another character in that movie who was hired to keep an eye on this guy. And it was, your dad was like a runner up for that. Um, that sure? Yeah. My dad had told me years ago that we may be in the Vegas. He didn't tell me why I found out years later that, he was one of the gentlemen in the mob that they were thinking about sending out there, but they didn't send my dad. They sent a the guy that was rising real quick in the mob. His name was Tony Spilatro, who was played by Joe Pesci in the movie Casino. Tony was a rising monster like my dad in Chicago. He was violent like my dad. He was a natural leader like my dad, and the bosses loved him like they liked my dad at one time. Actually, the bosses were, were grooming Tony to be a boss or the boss one. His first assignment in, I think it was 69 or 70, was to go out to Las Vegas and watch over the mob's interests out there, which was the skim, the way they stole money from the casino floor in the county room before the IRS could get in there, count it, and tax it. So the hotels that the, um, that the uh, mob had in, in Vegas at that time was the Fremont, the Marina, the Hacienda, and the Stardust. The gentleman that they had out there running him at the time, who was played by Robert De Niro in the movie, was Lefty Rosenthal. Lefty Rosenthal was like a modern-day Bugsy Siegel. He was great at running casinos, unbelievably great at sports handicapping. 
So when Tony went out to Vegas, all he did was assist um, uh, Robert De Niro, Lefty Rosenthal, and make sure the skin got back. That's all he had to do. And uh, top, Tony was an ambitious guy. When he got out to Vegas, he noticed that all the casinos in Vegas were actually owned by different mob families around the country. That means that that those casinos we call spoken for. You can't go in that casino and do any illegal business or you're going to have a problem and start a mob war. But the city of Las Vegas was an open city. There was no mob family controlling the city. So Tony decides to take over the city without the boss knowing that home, which leads into all this stuff that Tony was doing wrong. And then at one point in 83, when the bosses from five, five crime families around the country all got arrested in Kansas City, it was called Operation Strawman. Strawman means ownership in name only, meaning that all these fictitious name, all these people that that the government thought was owning these casinos, they were just the fronts for all the mob families and they were all skimming. So when all the bosses went to, to trial in Kansas City in 1983, they were all found guilty. They started looking into Tony and they found out that Tony was causing a lot of problems. So they put a hit out on Tony. They send a hit crew. At the time, my dad was recovering from surgery. So my uncle was part of that hit crew. In the movie, Casino showed you getting them killed in a cornfield. In real life, our case showed where they really got killed, in a basement in Chicago, then buried in a cornfield. And there were convictions on that case. How many deaths do you think occurred in the Las Vegas area from mob activity over the years? Oh, I, I, I you know what? It would be a total guess. I could, you know... I mean, the purpose of the mob being out it was not to kill people. Where you don't don't bring heat. Don't kill people in the neighborhood. Don't bring heat where you're doing business. The mob. A lot of people thought the mob tried to take over Vegas. They weren't take, trying to take over Vegas. They just wanted a piece of it. I mean, eventually, when you add in human error and stuff, so I don't have any idea how many people. You know, I know there were convictions. There were some, you know, quite a few convictions on people getting killed. But you don't know because a lot of times they're killed and the bodies are buried so they're never found again. Right. And the way there's a special way that they bury them, right? So that well, the dad would know. A lot of different ways depending on who does it. I mean, one of our Tony Spilatro's tricks and a few guys in the Chicago outfit is in the desert to ground his heart. So you can't go out there with a body in your trunk and stay out there for six or seven hours digging a hole. Um, what he would do is pre dig holes, you put plywood over it, you put dirt on top of it, you put a marker on it. Um, when you come out to throw the body in the hole, you bring it that animal carcass. You fill it up halfway, then you throw the animal and you fill it up the half the other half. This way if somebody's digging down, they see it, they won't dig further. If you have cadaver dogs, they won't be able to tell, they'll be confused. Um, so that was one of the tricks. When Lake Mead started draining, you know, a lot of people I know were reaching out. Hey, do you think it could be this person? Do you think it could be that person? You know, again, that, that's a different style. I don't know, but that's a different type of style because, remember, you have to, you have, to have a boat. You have to get a car to a boat. Most boats are in marinas, so now you've got to transport the body from the car to the boat. So if you're going to uh, kill somebody and, and, and drown them in the lake, you'd have to get them on the boat to go out for a ride alive and hope nobody's seen you guys on the boat. So I don't know, and I had no knowledge of if anybody did. I know there was a lot of bodies buried in the desert by Tony Spilatro that had probably never been found. And for those listening, what he's referring to at Lake Mead is um, – over the last two years, I'd say, they found about seven bodies that washed out of Lake Mead. And one of them um, was a suspect for criminal activity because he was in a barrel um, with cement or something. His feet was in cement inside that barrel when they found it. But, and it, again, they said that that was found, the body was found in the 70s. So, he disappeared. Yeah. 
something like that. Business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and again, a lot of copycat crimes too. You know, at one time there were guys that were put in barrels with with weighted barrels with holes in the barrels so the water would get in there, and they killed them like that. You know, or or you know, they 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 used a bucket and put their feet in there and um, chained them up and just let the concrete dry and then threw them you know, in the water, too. I mean, there's a lot of things. But then there's a lot of copycat crimes, too. So you, you don't know for sure. But it, it, yeah. it's, it's interesting. You know, nobody ever thought Lake Meads would start going down, and now all of a sudden. But you do see in movies a lot, which happens in real life, is somebody buries somebody somewhere, then all of a sudden it's in construction or something like that, and they literally have to go over the bodies. I mean, it was done a couple times in Sopranos, um, I think in uh, John Gotti's story, they were talking about how they had to move somebody or something. So it does happen. Um, one of the, the one of the legends here in town is they think that there's bodies buried underneath Par um, not Paris, but the pyramid, the Luxor. Oh, okay. I've always heard that, but I don't know what the connection, I don't know if there's any connection to the mob or not, but it's, but there's a story about people being buried underneath there, concreted over and everything when they were building it. But I don't know well, the whole know, story. Yeah, and that old saying, 86 was eight miles out from the city and six feet down, you know, and at one time, you know, the Luxor was kind of outside the city, <laughs> not eight miles, but it's outside the city you know, so um, it very well could be. Somebody <laughs> knows the life. It's interesting. Well, Frank, we have to take a quick break. Um, when we, we will continue this discussion with organized crime insider and author Frank Calabrese in his book, Operation Family Secrets, How a Mobster's Son and the FBI Brought Down Chicago's Murderous Crime Family After This. Do you want to experience a real Cajun country spooky paracon? Join Louisiana Spirits for their second annual Paracon on March 23rd in New Iberia, Louisiana. You don't want to miss this Raging Cajun event with speakers like Dave Schrader, Sierra Lima, Shane Pittman, and the Searchers, and more. This fun afternoon will feature food trucks offering local lunch cuisines, and there will be an exhibit hall open all afternoon. So get your hoodoo ready and your gurgries out and join Louisiana Spirits at Sleeman Theater for the Performing Arts in New Iberia, Louisiana this March 23rd. Visit www.laspirits.com for more information. That's www.laspirits.com. Small Town Tales podcast continues. And welcome back to this episode of Small Town Tales podcast. If you're just tuning in, my guest, Frank Calabrese Jr., author of the book, Operation Family Secrets, how a mobster's son and the FBI brought down Chicago's murderous crime family. Frank, what led you into going against your own father and cooperating with uh, the authorities? What brought you to this point? Um, well, there wasn't uh, just one instance that, you know, that brought me to this point. There were a lot of different things that were happening, again, going back to, um, you know, uh, this life changing my dad and him not being the one we thought he would be. I mean, he had three personalities. There was this good side to him. We've seen a lot of it when he was young. He always had a tough side. He was naturally tough. And uh, he also always had a problem with his temper and he always tried to control it. But this nice guy was one. And then there was this street guy that was very, very, very street smart and very manipulative. You know, I learned a lot from that character over the years. I just used it in a positive way now, and I actually used it against my dad when I went against him. And then the third side of my dad is a sociopathic killer who was convicted of killing 13 people, killed a handful more than I know of, okay, that he wasn't convicted on. And um, the way he killed you was with a rope and a knife. He'd strangle you when he knew you were dead. He'd cut your throat from ear to ear. In some law enforcement circles, in some circles in Chicago, they called it the Calabrese necktie, which was derived from the Sicilian necktie. Um, and it got to a point where I had my family now. I had some successful businesses. 
me and my dad were bumping heads. And dad was the kind of guy that if you said no to him, he looked at it as being disrespectful. Also, if you, it was all or nothing with him, and if it wasn't all with him, and he couldn't control you, that means you do everything he says without question, also disrespectful. The manipulator that he was, this was the final, one of the final straws with me, was one day he called me about working on relationships and meeting for coffee. So he said, meet me over by the park. I went over there, I hopped in his truck to go for coffee on the way there. He goes, hey, I gotta stop at the garage for a second, take a walk with me, finish that story. I get in there, I walk in the garage, we're laughing, all of a sudden the door slams, I turn around, he's got me by the neck, he's got a gun in my cheek, and he's got this glassy-eyed look. He says, I tried controlling you, you're uncontrollable. I'd rather have you dead than you keep disrespect for me, but don't worry, I'll respect you, I'll come to your grave and, and bring flowers. Oh my God, I got set up, I thought I was too smart to be set up, they always say somebody close to you. He's going to kill me. He's going to bury me somewhere. My kids are going to go through life. I'm trying to get them away from this. They're going to wonder whatever happened to their dad. I got to get out of this garage. I'm trying to hug him. I'm trying to kiss him on the cheek. I won't break eye contact. I'm crying and I'm using trigger words. Dad, I'm your son, mom, kids, wife. What's going on? I, I don't know what I said or did that night, but I got out of that garage. And from that point, and my dad was the kind of guy that if you don't ever pull a gun on somebody and not finish it, it will come back to bite you in the rear. And I went and got that gun. And from that point on, I never trusted my dad again. And our relationship was really, really in a bad place. Not in only our relationship, but me. I'm in a bad place now. My dad tried to kill me. The government's getting stronger. Um, the mob's getting more paranoid. I got this wife and kids, and I got to straighten out. I did a lot of bad things, okay? And I was doing a lot of bad things, and I just didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted to get away from them, and I'm walking around with Duck's gun, and I'm thinking, what's going to happen next? How much worse could this get? So when you cooperated with the law enforcement and authorities, how was that set up? So... Back to what I was just telling you, how much worse is this going to get in 1995 in July? We got indicted on the last day of statute of limitations, a 10-year-old case. Uh, me, my dad, my uncle, my brother, and about seven other crew members for running a loan sharking racket through threats, intimidation, and extreme violence. The whole time I worked for my dad. I first seen this happen, my first thought was prison, jail was going to be my way out. It was going to be my way away from this man that's trying to control me and won't let me go. It's going to straighten me up and I could come home and be a family man and get out of my life. I needed prison. Again, I wasn't a victim. So when we all pled guilty and we all got into prison, the first day I woke up in prison, I felt like a million dollars. I was in a maximum security to start and then I was going to be there for about six months. At the end of it, right around the six month point, they, they transfer you out because I got five years and I couldn't, I couldn't stay there any longer. Now, everybody else in the case pled guilty and except one guy, he was offered three years. He pled guilty and he got 10. He got 10. I got five years. My dad got 12, my uncle got seven, my brother got two. The rest of the guys got a hand, a couple, a couple, two, three each. Um, you know, the, the greatest thing about all this was I was waiting for my dad. Now I'm waiting to see where I'm going because I'm in a maximum. I'll probably go down to a high or a medium and or even a low. And and you get a little more freedom in there. I can work on my life, work on, you know, who am I? What am I going to do when I get home? The list goes up on the counselor's door and it says that I'm going to the same prison as my dad. And it freaked me out. Now, the only man I ever feared in life was my dad. I respect what other men are capable of. It just felt fair. So that was, I never did a bad day in prison except that day. That was the day that I found out I was going to the prison with my dad. Now through prison transportation, I wound up locked down in the hole for 16 days in Terre Haute Penitentiary. 
And I lost that fear of my dad. I says, I'm going to go there and I'm going to try to work this out with my dad one more time. Um, you know, some of the things that there were some promises made between me and my dad when we went into prison. And the two things I asked him to promise me was that he would never pull me back in this life when I got out. I have restaurants. I want to go back to my restaurants. And also promise that we're going to work on our relationship as a father and son when we get home because you tried to kill me. Okay, so my concern going to the same prison and my father is if he is he going to try to pull me back in or is he going to keep trying to manipulate me like he did all his life? So I was down six months. I wound up in Milan, Michigan. And for the eight month, the next eight months, I was working on my relationship with my dad. Now, he's seen me doing real good time. And we were talking a lot. And I noticed he's starting to manipulate me again. He's the same old dad. He's trying to involve me and stuff. He's trying to bring me back in. And I realized at one point. It's all or nothing with him. If I don't go back in with him, he's going to finish what he started one night in that garage when we get home at some point. So that's when I had to make some choices. Your dad had a hit on you, right? Was that before or after the prison? No, that's right. Yeah, when he found out I was cooperating. So um, there's, there's, you know, sometimes you got to make a decision that I talk about. And sometimes all your choices stay. Okay. And so I came down with two after days and days and days of thinking. And also remember that a lot of what my dad taught me, you know, when you're making a big decision, don't make it out of anger. Sit down and look at all the options and make sure you can live with that decision. So I came with two. One. Wait till we get back on the street and confront my dad on the street. Here's a man that's killed a lot of people very good at it. And the only way I can get I, I can get the edge on him is why when he gets out, just try to kill him right away. Now, morally, that that I didn't think that was right because my dad that day in the garage, he tried to kill him, but he didn't. So it was one other option I thought about, and that option was keeping him locked up forever. How am I gonna do that? In my neighborhood, the worst thing you can do is be a rat or be a snitch. The FBI, contact the FBI, they're our enemy. So I thought of a business proposal with the government. I didn't know if it could be done. I don't know if anybody done it before. I said, but it don't hurt to try. I helped them keep my dad locked up forever. So I sent this, this letter out, the infamous letter that I said to him after being down locked up 14 months, I sent the letter out, and you know, and in the letter, I, I I didn't put anything personal in there. I typed it for no handwriting. I wore gloves for no fingerprints, and basically, I said, "Come on out. I want to talk to you. Nobody can know for my safety, not even my lawyer." Okay, don't bring no recording equipment. Just bring a pen and paper. I want to help you against my dad. I feel like I have to help you keep this sick man locked up forever. And after some time later, they came out. And that's what turned into me starting cooperate. And what I did was to get my dad to incriminate himself because he was so street smart. I wound up wearing a wire in prison that the warden did not want to okay because he said, no way, it's only in movies. This kid's going to get killed in my prison. But at the last minute, because of a court order, he said, okay. Now I got to incriminate the smartest man I know on the street that talk guys twice on the street. And later on, when I was working with the FBI, caught on to a ruse that the FBI was working on one of the guys that bought into it totally. And my dad said right away, that's the FBI. They're trying to set you up. Don't do nothing. That's how smart he was. So what I did was I knew him better than anybody. I went out on the yard without a wire. And I said, Dad, I said, one more time, I'm willing to work on our relationship. I go, I got major issues with you. You don't even know half of it. I says, and if we don't work it out, you're dead to me. I said, but if you, we do work out, I've decided I want back in the crew when I get out. That's when my dad eyes lit up. He goes, yeah, let's talk tomorrow. And that was the beginning point of, of me starting to cooperate. During that time, you know, my dad talked to me. When you want to get people to talk, um, anger and liquor, get them to talk. My dad always had an anger problem and a temper pit one person against another. He was mad at my uncle for telling people on the street he didn't pay for the crew's lawyers, which he didn't do. But my dad got mad at telling, my uncle telling people 
So I got my dad so mad at my uncle during this that uh, he put out a hit on my uncle in another prison. He sent his blessing saying that there's a problem. He's not going to stand up, do what you need to do. You got my blessing. They tried to do something to my uncle. It got blotched. My uncle started cooperating. This is what turned into the biggest trial in Chicago since the days of Al Capone. Operation Family Secrets. They dubbed it that because I cooperated against my father. See, when I sent that letter, I didn't want to be obligated to the government. So I told him, I'll do all my time, pay all my fines, no immunity, but I'm only helping you against my dad. Oh, that was my deal with that. Okay. And, um, and they really, as far as I know, till this day, they really never had anybody that came forward like that. Usually when guys cooperate, they can't do their time. They're jammed up on another case or somebody put a hit on them or something. So that's what turned into the biggest trial. And also it took down what was less left of the Chicago mob um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it was the first time in the history of Chicago that a high ranking made member, my uncle Nick, uh, testified and he, and he decimated the mob. If you go back all the way to early 1900s, this trial was in 2007. Um, there was a little over 1,100 documented gangland slangs with only 14 convictions. In this case alone, 18 convictions. My dad was charged with 13 murders, and there was close to 30 murders that were solved. You know, because of the RICO Act, if you can prove the organization did two criminal acts every 10 years, you could go back another 10 years. In this case, they went back 40 years. Also, uh -huh. when they trial started, they, I found out my dad put a $75,000 hit on my head and $70,000 hit on my Uncle Nick's head. Now, my Uncle Nick was in witness protection prison. I passed on witness protection. I had my reasons. And, um, you know, so I was out on the street. Were you scared? No, I wasn't scared. I mean, I, I, I don't scare easy. Um, but, you know, I, I know my dad and knew him better than anybody. And he stiffed a lot of people and he doesn't like to pay. And a lot of people didn't like my dad on the street. Um, I just didn't feel that um, he could get somebody to do it. But I still had my guard up. I was still aware of my surroundings. Again, I am one of these people. I think like them. I know how they look for you. I'm not. See, another thing I did was I got word out to a lot of guys that I could have gotten in trouble. You know, and, and I says, hey, this is between me and my dad. I know you don't agree with what I'm doing, and, and that's fine. That's beside the point. I'm just going to tell you, you stay out of it, and your name will never come out of my mouth. I give you my word. And the trial came and went, and they've seen it. So, you know, I and I also got lucky because when I first got two guys got killed, they would have came after me no matter what. They were close with my dad. And another five guys that would have came after me also died naturally in a short period of time. So, you know, it was kind of ironic that it was almost like I had somebody on my side, you know. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I had to live my life. And um, I always had to give my dad. The reason I passed on witness protection is I had already put my family through enough. I didn't want to put my kids and my wife through that. And also, um, I'm not one to run and hide. And the way my dad thought, if he couldn't get to me, is somebody I care about and do some possibly do something to them. So I needed him to always have that opportunity to think that he could, you know, there were people crank calling family members of mine. There was, you know, people trying to threaten stuff like that, but you know, it's the guys that don't say anything that don't make the calls. Those mm -hmm. are the guys that I, those are the guys that you always keep your guard up. Um, if I seen them around me, I would have been concerned, but I also stayed out of their way too. You know, even to this day, there's certain places I won't go because there's some guys I respect they're capable of. And why should I go in that place to make them have to do something? It's like right. challenging them. You know? So I'm, I'm just showing them that respect slash courtesy so that they're not like, ah, we got to go get this guy. You know, I'm not making it personal. Was your wife scared while this was all yeah. happening? Yeah. 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 She was. <laughs> We actually got divorced in prison. That's how scared she was. Oh, wow. And when I first in prison, because I never suffered a day in prison. Well, that one day I told you when I found out I was being transferred. But it's your wife, it's your kids that suffer. Okay, not us. I'm a street guy. I know how I know how to survive. And I did survive in prison. Um, 
you know, when I got out, she was so scared of my dad and she started, she started to get scared of me because people were in her ear that she divorced me. So when, when she brought the kids and I wanted to work on our relationship, I wanted to get my family back together. And she started crying one day. She was all shaky. I go, what's wrong? She, she with the kids. And they came to pick me up one of the first Sundays. I was in the halfway house so we could go and have breakfast. And she says, I, my blood pressure's through the roof. And I go, why? What happened? She goes, I'm scared. I go, of who? She says, you. I go, what? I had tears in my eyes. Why are you scared of me? She goes, I don't know. She goes, I think you're going to kill me. I go, Lisa, I, where did you get that from? I says, if I ever raised my hands to you, no. If I ever threatened you, no. I go, where is this coming from? I don't know, movies, other people talking. I go, Lisa, no way. I'm trying to get my family back together. And if you don't want to, I just want to be close with you. You're the mother of my children. And then I then I started laughing because she felt better. I gave her a hug. I says, and uh, I says, anyways, you would always get a pass. I says, if I ever did anything to you, that's like hurting my own children. I'll never hurt my own children. You know, so to this day, we're very close. You know, we each have our, we each have somebody in our life. We, we, we wound up trying it for a little while and it was just too much history. And we became very close and, and we're friends and we raised the kids together. So it's, even though my dad's been dead since 2012, she still sometimes when she drives and sees him in the rear view mirror following her, that's how spooked she was. Wow. During that trial, when you had to testify against your dad, what was that like for you? Was that hard? Hardest thing I ever did in my life. Remember, just because I hated my dad's ways, I still had this unconditional love for my dad. It was always in my heart until the day of that trial. I should say until the day of the trial. The day in prison when I had enough of my dad, I knew he was never going to change. and That's why I made the decision. So I knew he was never going to change. When I walked in that courtroom, I knew about the hit it put out that head. I didn't want to give him the satisfaction looking at him so he can give me dirty looks and play the games, mind games he likes to play. So I'm looking straight ahead, but I caught him out of the corner of my eye across the room. And he's looking at me and he's staring and he's looking at me like a father would look at a son that he hadn't seen for six years. Remember, I didn't see my dad for almost six years. Okay. I, in the corner of my eye, my dad had aged. You know, my first instinct was I was overcome with emotion. I wanted to run over there. I wanted to hug him. I wanted to say, Dad, when are you going to learn? We got to go home enough. But as soon as he gave me those dirty looks, when I finally did face him, uh, I knew I was there. After a week of, of sleepless nights, getting up and testifying on the stand, I got off the stand. I went to the room. Tears are coming down my eyes. Prosecutor comes in what happened I said I'm okay just give me a minute I you know how sad and sick this is that's the last time I'm ever going to see my dad alive and was the last time I see him alive they were all found guilty my dad and the other bosses got life in the federal prison um, and you know it wasn't about fear with my dad at that point it was about God you know we had chances my dad got sick during the Spalacho murders in the 80s. I said, Dad, me and your, your, my brother, Kurt, we have legitimate businesses. Everybody thinks you're dying. He had a tumor in his pituitary gland. Anytime I go to the club, guys are like, oh, how's your dad doing? And I would make these looks like I don't want to say how he's really doing. It's bad, but uh, he's doing great. And I'd be like, oh, he's doing great. Now, what the guys are thinking is, oh, you know, he's dying. He just doesn't want to say that he's acting up. But the way they couldn't say I lied to him later if they found out he really was doing great, you know, because like I said, I told you he was doing great. And um, he had a chance. In this life, you know, you're, once you're in, the only way out is feet first, death. There's one option during the choice, though. If you're sick, you're older, you could step back and retire. Okay, and they'll never call for you, but you always have to be available if they do call for you. I told my dad, you could step back and retire, spend your time down in Florida. This life is changing. Government's getting stronger. Guys are going to prison like crazy. I says, and we can just go legit. Well, you got the money, more money than God. We got businesses. Let's work together. 
He says, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. He got better. He went down to the club one day. He says, I'm, I'm going to start running this neighborhood like it's supposed to be. Run. What he did was he was addicted to this life. It wasn't about money no more. It wasn't about family no more. It was addiction to the power, to the fear, and to the greed, the money. It changed my dad. On top of my book, my mother said, I divorced my dad in the 80s. In that prison picture of you and your dad, your dad's eyes are black. He turned into a heartless, soulless person. He became who his mentor was, Angela Hukla a soulless sociopathic killer. She was Frankie, when your dad was young, he was a good guy. He had a big heart. Yeah, he was tough. Yeah, he had a temper problem, but he was a good man. He said, that man there in that picture, I don't know him. And that's really what this life did to my dad, you know, and I tried everything I can do. Okay. And, you know, I'm the one that cooperated against them. Okay. My uncle cooperated against them and we had our reasons, whether you guys think it's right or wrong. We had our reasons. You sometimes you got my brother who didn't cooperate against him, pled guilty because my dad basically intimidated him to plead guilty saying, you're only going to get a boot camp. He should have never been in that case. My brother, I told my brother, do not plead guilty. You can beat this. You don't belong in this case. It's, 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 a, it's a ridiculous charge they're giving you. He listened to my dad, went to jail for two years. When he came home, my dad manipulated the hell out of him from prison. And my brother to this day is having, having uh, major problems emotionally and, and mentally because of what my dad to, did to him. And here's a loyal son. The only thing he ever did was what his dad told him to do. And he manipulated my brother and he played with his head until the day he died. Frank, your story was, is just so incredible. So yeah, much of your story. I'm sorry, go ahead. So much of your story is about reinvention, um, which you've, you've become a great inspiration for a lot of people through your life with this story, I'm sure. What is your advice to someone who may be listening that is involved in some sort of crime or something in their life, maybe in which they wish to get away from, who may be feeling that there's no way for them? Well, I, I, I do come across a lot of people like that. And it's not just about crime. It's about people that have families, have, um, have uh, uh, a, a parent or parents or the home is toxic. Uh, I, you know, and they have abusive parents mentally, physically. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I tell people as far as a criminal, if you're a criminal, the hardest thing you ever did would have to change my life. What helped me was because I always worked jobs. I always had businesses. Look, just because I left this life doesn't mean what I know left me. Okay. I am my father in a lot of ways. He taught me. He was my mentor. When you want to change your life, change is easy, but when it gets tough, when it gets real tough, what do you do? You go back to what I knew, the street. And I caught anything I did. I went to jail for what my dad did one time. So most guys go back because it's what they know. So this still happen. I have a criminal mentality in me somewhere that I have to battle with. It's a criminal justification. You know, I see something that would be like taking me from a kid and I say, wow, I just got this $600 paycheck last week. One more time. Do something good with the money. Give it to my kids. I have to back step back and process. Okay, now when it was talking about getting back to work, you got to get rid of that grandiose. you got to get rid of that quick score. You have to do what most people do every day. We call them nine to five square guys. That's what we call them. No disrespect to them, but you know you got you got a budget. You you know you get a check. You do all this stuff, and um, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. And you have to start at the bottom. So you know if I'm going to start as a toilet cleaner, I'm going to use everything I know to 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 kill that job so I can move up as far as fast as I can. And earn what I got from everything I learned on the street. I just use it in a positive way. Okay. And I also tell people, if you are having a problem at home, if you are having a problem with somebody in your life, whether it's abuse, whether it's control, make sure that you can live with, the, with, with whichever you decide to do. And make sure you plan three or four steps ahead. 
It's going to be a hard thing to do, but don't give up. If it's what you have to do, as long as you know as an individual that you have a good heart and you want to do the right thing, you don't have to convince anybody else. Do it when the time's ready. So, you know, and my kids, my kids are the ones I answer to every day. I got another chance with them. 33 and 32 years old says, you know, I, I could never be forgiving from myself for what I put my kids through or my ex-wife. All I can do is do what I know. We all make mistakes. It's what we do with those mistakes that define us in the long run. Frank, thank you so much for taking the time from your busy schedule to be on Small Town Tales podcast. Where can people find your book and... Certainly, they can visit you at the Mob Museum, can't they? Yes. So I'm at the Mob Museum right now until the end of June. I'm there four days a week. If you go to mobmuseum.org, it'll show the programs I have. I'm also in the public area so many hours a day during those four days. Got a lot of great programs coming up. You can get my book two ways. You can go to frankkellerbridgejr.com. And when I say junior, it's jr.com. And if you order the book on there, there is a spot for me to sign it to whoever you want me to sign it to. And if you want me to write something in there, you can tell me what to write or tell me to write what I want to write. And then you can do the same thing with the Mom Museum. You can order the book there also and click the box for signed. And they also have a space. You've been listening to Small Town Tales Podcast. I'm your host, C.L. Thomas from somewhere in the Mojave Desert. Until next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Small Town Tales Podcast. While you wait for the next episode, Follow the show on Facebook under Small Town Tales Podcast. Learn more about C.L. Thomas at our website, clthomas.org. Small Town Tales Podcast was produced by 22 Creations Multimedia, LLC.